So I'll be talking about Auto Planner, uh, which is um, uh, a planning engine really, and um, it, it solves planning problems. And the world is really full of planning problems. So um, just to give you an example, um, my wife and I traveled here for our vacation, and uh, we wanted to see this nice region. Uh, and you can see this, this is a region. So um, and we marked a few uh, places where we wanted to visit, you know, probably the, you know, the typical tourist places. Um, so we immediately found a, a planning problem saying, that, okay, in which order will we visit these places, right? So we were here for six days, and um, we, need to, we need to figure out, um, yeah, there's more than six uh, locations that we want to visit, but it's probably a good idea when we go to Nice to visit all these three at the same time, right? So um, we basically created a route saying, okay, on, on day one we'll do this, on day two we'll do this, and so forth. But there were also a few constraints. The first two days here there, there, there was raining, so uh, we said, okay, we don't, we don't want to visit, uh, for example, the, the, the islands before Cannes um, during the rain. So we said uh, we don't want to do that the first two days according to the, the, the weather report and so forth. And, and there are a whole bunch of other constraints, um, like uh, maybe, for example, today I want to make sure I'm here on time and so forth, so we don't want to do a long trip. And you get a planning problem, right? So you need, you need to find a route. Now, this was vacation, so it doesn't really matter much, right? So we just do it uh, uh, as we like it, and, and we, we debated a little bit, and we said, okay, let's do this on that day. But um, if you do, if you are, if you have a business and you do these kind of routes every day, then you can save quite a lot of mileage, a lot of fuel, if you do this in the correct order. If you figure out to say, okay, when I go here I, and I do this one, then I might want to go over here and that one on the same day, right? So um, you might not be going on vacation, of course, if you're delivering items. So, um, uh, and I'll show you an example in a few minutes about that. So. Let me, let me start with, uh, with a quick demo. Um, so this is the Opto Planner examples application. You can run this yourself if you want to try it. And uh, I'll start with the traveling salesman problem. Um, has anybody here heard of, of the traveling salesman problem? Quite a few people. It's a pretty simple problem. You have, um, uh, for example, here you have a map of Europe. And you need to figure out um, in which order you will visit all of these capitals. So these are all the capitals of, of all the cities of Europe. And uh, you want to minimize the distance that you travel. So uh, you could do it, for example, like this is a pretty, this is a pretty good route, as you can see. Right? Um, it's actually not that good, but it's, it's, it's a route. Or you could do it like this. That's probably a bad idea to do it in this order, right? Now, um, let's see what we what we get if we try uh, if we let Opto Planner uh, find our route. So, as you can see, it finds a route. Finds a route, and you can see the distance over here. But as we give it more and more time, you'll see the distance actually slowing, well, it becoming less and less. Uh, so it's a shorter and shorter route. Um, now, of course, it's, it will never be null because yeah, you need to visit all of the you need to. Uh, across quite a few distances, but you can actually minimize it and, and save a lot of fuel. The nice thing is, is because uh, we can actually add points in real time. So for example, you can say, uh, let's visit uh, over here, over there, and so forth, a few nice places in France. And you can see it automatically adds those, and it, uh, in real time it actually changes the, the route uh, according to these states. Now you might think, okay, it's pretty easy. If you add a point over here, it will just, you know, Let's, let's add one over there. It will just say, okay, you go down, up, and it's pretty easy. You add one point and, and nothing really changes. But let's see what happens if I add a point over here. So you can see that we're going to uh, from uh, Rika to Warsaw to Vilnius. But if I add a point over there, you can see that all of a sudden Warsaw is no longer in this section, but it's in this section. And this can actually be quite and uh, into, this can be actually be a snowball effect, which then affects that maybe Prague gets into this section and so forth. So there can be quite a huge snowball effect uh, to, to find a, a better route if you just add one point. It can actually change the entire problem. That's the nice thing about these kind of pro kind of problems. Okay. Um, let me take a more serious version of that. It's the vehicle routing problem. Suppose we own uh, a company. 
and so over here we have a, a, a factory or something like that and we have a bunch of customers so you can see there's a customer over here um, who and a customer over here and so forth so this is a map of the country and each customer demands a number of items for example uh, this customer wants 7 items, this customer wants 21 items, this one wants 2 items. Right? Now we have trucks, and each truck can carry 100 items. Suppose there are televisions. Suppose you have a television store, a te television factory, and you're delivering to television stores all across the country. So you need to deliver 7 uh, televisions there, but you can only carry 100 televisions per truck. So let's see what OptoPlanner does with that. I'm going to immediately stop it. Uh, for a second, uh, so you can see what's going on first. You can see over here there's a truck, it's not carrying more than 100 items, only 98 items, and it's delivering at those points. You can see we have a certain fuel, but you can also pretty easily visually see that this is not perfect yet. So let's give it a little bit more time. And you can see, and you'll see that it's, it's uh, optimized to find a shorter and shorter route. Now you might think, okay, it's crossing roads here, so that's probably not optimal. Actually, it can be optimal. Uh, you never know, because um, if this is, for example, 25 <coughs> items, and this is, for example, 100 items, and then, then a trick delivering those two items uh, can, actu can actually be the only thing that works. So let's see if we add a few more things. You can see that actually uh, it's pretty easy, but if you actually start adding way too many dots, you can see it's still finding an, uh, a feasible route. I mean, there's no truck which is carrying more than 100 items, but they're all very filled up right now. So let's see if we really add more and more points. We'll see that now we have trucks overloaded, right? And we can change the, the, the function to actually try to, uh, in that case, <coughs> not schedule those customers. But in this case, I've said, okay, just, just schedule them anyway and let's see which, which trucks are overloaded. Um, but it still tries to minimize the overloaded one. There's not, there's not a single truck which is, can still carry one extra item. And as we give it a little bit more time, it actually finds a more optimal solution, even though it is, it's an infeasible solution. Okay. So, what is a planning problem? Right? Planning problem is where we want to complete goals, such as, such as uh, produce uh, products or uh, deliver services. With limited resources, such as uh, assets, uh, such as um, uh, humans, uh, so employees, such as uh, assets, such as, uh, for example, um, vehicles, buildings, and so forth, um, and of course with, uh, with limited time and money, right? And you have to do this under constraints. Uh, some of the constraints are basically the constraints of the universe. Uh, you cannot put 200 items in the truck, which can only carry 100 items. There, there's just no room. Or um, and there's no, or the weight won't uh, will be basically the truck will break down. Uh, and other constraints are things like uh, we want to spend as less fuel as possible, right? Save as much money as possible. Right? Uh, but there are, could be other constraints like making the employees as, uh, as happy as possible and making the customers as happy as possible. You have to weigh all those against each other and say, okay, what do you want to optimize and and, and how do you balance these things out? Let me give you one more example, uh, just to. to, to to show you better. Um, this is the nurse rostering example. So let me just take set here. So in this case, we have 10 nurses. Right? You can see them over here and they're smiling. Right? Nurses are always smiling. And um, they have to work uh, for an entire month. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and so forth. You can see the month. You can actually scroll. And um, we have a whole bunch of unassigned shifts. So we, over here we have uh, uh, two early shifts. Over here we have two late shifts, uh, day shift and a night shift, right? So we need to figure out which employee gets which shift. So let, let's see what happens if you do this quickly. This is the first setup, right? Uh, as you can see, employee one is working a late shift, and then an early shift, and then an early shift. Um, it depends on the hospital what kind of extra constraints there are. They usually have a lot. Uh, in this case, it's late followed by early. You might think this is a bad thing. In this hospital, they decided that's not, that's not a bad thing. Uh, I would say that's a bad thing. Um, the things they, they didn't mind about are things like, um, if you get a free day, for example, over here, you should at least have two free days. So this is a bad thing. Over here, the constraint will be broken. 
Um, and then there's a bunch of uh, other constraints. So first of all, you have hard and soft constraints. The hard constraints are quite simple. All of the assign all of the shifts need to be assigned. That's one. And the other one is also very simple. Every um, every employee can only work one shift per day. So if you, for example, you put this late shift on employee two. Uh, no, it's employee three actually. Right. So then now we're breaking a hard constraint. So you can actually see that on the bottom. Minus one hard constraint. That's bad. Um, but there are a whole bunch of soft constraints. Um, actually, there's a whole list here. I know my GUI needs some more improvements, but uh, you know, I'm writing the engine, not the GUI, so I don't care too much about the GUI. But uh, there's a whole bunch of them, and the, the first one uh, is a pretty important one: is the day off request. Um, it happens a lot. So um, when the area is grayed out, then the nurse is asking a day off on the thing. So for example, nurse zero doesn't want to work this Friday and this Saturday, and she doesn't want to work this, the early shift on Sunday. Uh, and you can see there, there's a whole bunch of these uh, uh, day off requests, of course. And we want to make the nurses as happy as possible. So we want to say to all nurses, when you want a day off, on that day, we'll try to give you that, if it's possible. Um, so uh, let's see what happens if we give it a little bit more time. Start solving. And you can see it's moving shifts around, and it's trying to optimize it, and trying to find a better and better solution. And you can see that the score actually goes down, and that's about it's around 60, I think 59, if I recall correctly. And at that point, it's uh, it's, it's up to more, more, to more. So let, let's see what happens if we stop it. You might be wondering. Mm, okay, let me, let's check. Oh, over here, night shift, right? A night shift on a day that the nurse does not work. But why don't give that? Not, why shouldn't we just give that to let's say employee seven or something? Well, we'll see what happens if we actually do that. So the score should go down. So it should actually go up because it's negative. So it should be something like 58, 57. Let's see what happens if we actually do that. I haven't actually tried this one, so we'll see what happens. But as I expected, it actually goes up. Well, what just happened, right? We, we just we won one point because we just uh, but we lost five five or six points somewhere else because one of the other rules were break, was breaking. Um, I'm not quite sure which one is breaking in this case, um, but definitely one of the other ones are breaking like, um, yeah, maybe it's it's an, a night followed by a, a, an early shift is bad or something like that. There could be, yeah, there could be lots of reasons. Um, and actually on some dates it's pretty hard to, to please all the nurses because for example look at this Monday. On this Monday we want to schedule six shifts and we have three nurses that want to work. That's, that's, that's pretty hard, right? We can't uh, schedule six shifts uh, if only three nurses want to work. So three other nurses will have to work whether they like it or not. That's just, that's just uh, that's because uh, the day off request is a soft constraint. If we can please them, that's good. If we don't, uh, too bad for them. And the nice thing is, of course, that uh, these kind of plannings, is ha is, they, they happen every week, right? Or, or every day, it kind of depends. But most hospitals, they do this every week. And, um, and in practice, at this point, they usually use uh, a half a day. Uh, the head nurse takes one half a day a week to schedule these kind of plannings. And um, if you don't use a computer yet. And, and uh, it's pretty hard for them to actually find a feasible solution, let alone uh, an optimal solution for these. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically impossible. But uh, a week later, they'll have to sh schedule again, right? So what we just did is we scheduled for a month. And what we can do is now advance se seven days into the future. So I've just advanced seven days into the future. And you can see that this is locked. Why? We've put it on paper. We gave it to the nurses. The nurses are now saying, uh, OK, I have, this is what I need to do. And um, in the end, we've added seven new days, right? Right. So um, uh, we don't schedule shifts. So let's see what happens if we start planning this. Um, you'll see that these are immediately planned, or they move a lot. But actually, those three other weeks which are not written in stone yet, they might actually still move too. So uh, they are unlikely to move. But because of a snowball effect for the for the ones coming in at the back, you might actually get it all the way to over here. But these are written in stone, so these won't change. 
but you can't just delete these because <coughs> if you want, for example, uh, don't work more than five days in a row, and, and over here she might already be working four days in a row, then you can put an extra shift here. So you need you need you need the end. If they're like a month old, then you can start actually deleting them. So let's go back. Um, so the world is full of planning problems. Just to give you uh, a few ideas of, of where they are. Um, so employee rostering I've already covered. Uh, any form of agenda scheduling, uh, such as uh, uh, meetings, appointments, and so forth. Uh, you can actually, it depends, of course, not just normal meetings in, in a business thing, but more like uh, when is uh, the repair guy of the of the of of one of my equip of one of your home equipment coming over, right? He has to do a lot of uh, visits to a lot of uh, places. Educational timetabling, you know, typical course scheduling, exam scheduling, uh, typical uh, planning problem, and then vehicle routing, bin packing, uh, and so forth. Actually, a lot of in, in, in factories, you, you can find a lot of these kind of planning problems too, uh, and so forth, and in financial and so forth. Okay. Um, so, question is, are planning problems difficult to solve? Optimally, of course, right? Um, so, here's the interactive part, I'll be asking you a question. Uh, so, over here we have a computer at the top, which has 7 CPU. Right? We want to, so uh, this is a planning problem for uh, where we have to assign processes to computers. So think about, you have a cloud, uh, like Amazon or something like that, you have a whole bunch of computers, and you want to figure out which process do I put on which computer. So over here you have one computer, which has 7 CPU, and you have a process which takes 5 CPU, Let's say Jables 5 or something, they take quite a lot of CPU maybe. Jables, uh, so that's 5. Then you have a mail process which takes 3 CPU. Uh, we have a, a, another um, an, uh, 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 a calendar process takes 2 CPU. And you have Jables 7 which is very fast which takes only 1 CPU of course, right? So uh, you have to figure out which processes do I put on this computer. Um, and we want to fill it up as much as possible because we'll have to buy a new computer for the remaining processes. So for example, if you put process A on it, and that's only that, uh, then we fill five out of seven, and if we put the other three on the new computer, then we'll have to buy three plus two plus one is six, a computer of six CPU. So that'll be quite expensive. So pretty simple question. Anybody have uh, the idea which com process we put on this computer? Eighteen. Eighteen, brilliant. Yes, that's it. That's the optimal solution, A and C. So how did we find that solution? We had courses. <laughs> we had courses years ago. Yeah, yeah, you had courses. And, and what did the courses say? How did you find that solution? Any idea? You take the greedy one. The greedy one? You, you, you take the best one. Uh, you, yeah. you, you, you try to feel with the, the... The most constraint. Yeah. yeah. So if you have to program this, what would you do? How would you how would you loop through this to figure out A and C? You could say I'll try every combination with brute force, or you could say the greedy one, which says, okay, I'll just loop through it from top to bottom. Say I'll put in the A and, and that so forth. So let, let's take a look at. Let's presume brute force it doesn't really scale. I'll get back to that, um, and let's presume that the greedy one is the best one, right? Okay, so the greedy one is called first fit decreasing in, in this case, the algorithm. So what, what we do is we put in the five. So we first order them by decreasing size. So the biggest one first and then uh, smaller and smaller. We put in, we put it, just put it in there. So this five goes in there. And then we try to fit in the three. There's not enough room, right? Then we try to fit in the two, which works. Okay, then we have one, which try, we try to put in there. And okay, brilliant, we have our option optimal solution. This is a very good algorithm. Let's try this on another data set. Here's a new data set. Slightly different. Four and three instead of uh, two and, uh, three and two. So let's try this. We put in the five, works. Put in the four, doesn't work, not enough room. We put in the three, not enough room. We put in the one, works. Great, we have the optimal solution. Anybody disagree? <laughs> yeah, of course. The optimal solution is uh, three and four. So, so yeah, first fit decreasing failed. It, it, it just failed. Um, this is what they call being NP-complete. So 
uh, can you find an algorithm which actually finds the optimal solution and scale out? Today, humanity hasn't found that algorithm yet. It's that simple. So uh, that just works on any data set to find the optimal solution and scales out as it gets bigger and bigger. Um, yeah. So you have brute force and you have smarter ways of doing brute force which will find you the optimal solution. They don't scale. That's, ba that's basically their problem. So you need to find uh, a different way of doing it. Um, so this is basically the P versus NP question, which is a pretty famous question in computer science. Um, actually, if you looked at the Simpsons or Futurama, they actually have references to this. this so it's been, a long, it's been around for a long time. And um, um, it's, it's basically unresolved since, since a few decades. And there's actually a, a, a one million re, uh, reward on this. Uh, if you can actually prove that um, there is a, a one uh, association algorithm exists, or it doesn't exist at all. So if you can prove the opposite, you also get a million dollars. Um, and most of the experts, uh, including myself, include the, uh, believe that it is impossible to find optimal solutions scale out. But we might be wrong, you know. Um, and there are 3,000, there are like a lot, a lot of these MP conflict problems. Now the nice thing about this is, if you have uh, a planning problem in your business and you found, you've written this really, really smart algorithm which can solve this optimally and scale out, then we can, then uh, there's, uh, there's a guy who proved this uh, decades ago, that if you take this algorithm, the, for example, if you have a vehicle routing problem and you've found an algorithm that scales out and, and uh, solves optimally, that you can actually take that algorithm and through some math mathematical uh, fiddling, we can actually change that into an algorithm to, to do equipment scheduling or employee rostering or so forth. So uh, you ha just have to prove it on, you have just have to find that algorithm on one of these problems. And, and, and then you have it mathematically, they, they've already proven that, that it works on all of them. And unfortunately, uh, no, there's a lot of people saying I have this algorithm, nobody actually, actually found it yet. Uh, they were all proven wrong time and time again. But of course, if we want to schedule our processes to our computers, reality is a little bit more complex than just four processes and one computer, right? Reality is that we have multiple computers. So uh, in this case, I've just shown two, but more, it's more likely something like 2,000, 20,000, 200,000. Depends on if you're Google if you're, or if you're a small business. Um, and again, if you do first fit decreasing on this, uh, in this case, I've, I've gone for the smallest uh, uh, computers first, if, if there is a choice, uh, you'll see that, uh, and again, we, we don't find the optimal solution, right? Uh, although we, we do get something which is pretty, pretty okay, maybe. Um, and of course, in the real world, uh, we don't have to just watch CPU, we have to watch uh, memory, network bandwidth, a hard drive, and hard disk size, and so forth. So, um, in this case, uh, this process takes 5 CPU and 5 RAM, so uh, if we schedule it on computer Y, then you actually see that it takes the uh, RAM on both on the same machine. You can't say I'll take the, 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 the RAM on machine X and the CPU on machine Y. That, that doesn't just work that way, right? So again, uh, this, is, this doesn't, this isn't optimal solution. Right? Um, so first of decreasing, it does find the solution. It's not that bad, but it's, it's, it's definitely not optimal. Uh, so yes, planning problems are pretty difficult to solve. Uh, yeah, and by the way, uh, many people think humans are pretty good at this. Uh, humans are very good at deciding uh, and helping out to figure out what the constraints are, figuring out what you want to optimize, what is more important to optimize. And, and the human planners out there today, they are actually doing this. And so they're doing two jobs. They're, they're trying to find the, uh, the, uh, what they want to optimize, and they're actually optimizing it too. They really suck at the second part, at the search part. You really want the computer doing that. Uh, so yeah, and with OptoPlanner we can, uh, yeah, that's basically what OptoPlanner is, it's an open source project, uh, I've been working on it since 2006, it had a few names, Origi the last name was Drools Planner, uh, because it was part of the Drools project, but uh, we've been promoted to a top level JMOS project, so we're still very connected to the Drools project, project but it's, uh, we are now a standalone project, OptoPlanner, um, and yeah, it's, uh, fully documented, you have examples which I've just shown, so you, you don't have to worry about it too. I mean, you, you, there's good quality there. And uh, we have the Maven, uh, we're in Maven Central, so you can just take it out of there, or if you prefer, you can use the zips if you uh, still use it. And 
uh, or something like that. Okay, so uh, let's do the clouds balancing uh, thing. Uh, the, then let's take a look at this problem and implement it. So here we have a case of two computers and six processes. So we want to, and we need to scale those to these computers. Um, and we can see that here are the details, the details of the processes. This one uses one gigahertz, this one three gigahertz, and then there's memory and network bank like that that they need to. Um, this is a, a um, uh, this is random generated data, but most of the examples actually use uh, real-world data. Well, for example, nurse washing was from a real-world hospital, um, and so forth. Like, there's actually a, an advanced version of this, which actually has real-world data. Um, and let's see what happens if we scale them. Okay, so this is not too hard. But you can see that over here we have four processes, and they're using six gigahertz of 24 gigahertz, which has which the uh, which that computer has available. You can see that our computers are not uh, the same. They are some computers have more gigahertz, or others have less gigahertz. And, so and you can see that in this case, it's the network which is causing trouble, right? Because it's totally filled. And if you would do it differently, uh, the network uh, wouldn't uh, be right. So basically, in this case, if we if you just optimize for this, then we have our optimal solution. But that's just coincidence, right? And it's just two computers, so it's pretty simple. Another thing is. Um, for every computer that we use, we have to pay a maintenance fee. And you can see this in the back. Over here, we, this is the maintenance fee that we have to pay for each of the computers. So we want to main, So after we've actually optimized, uh, after, actually, after we're actually sure that the CPU power, the memory, and the network bandwidth has been fulfilled, we want to uh, minimize the cost of the computer. So let's take uh, a little bit of a bigger example. Here we have 100 uh, computers and 300 processes. Um, and let's see if we solve this. We can actually see that, it's, uh, that already all of the hard constraints are met. So um, there is enough CPU on every computer. There's enough memory on every computer, and there's enough network bandwidth, network bandwidth weight on every computer. But what it's doing now, it's actually turning down computers, it's shutting down computers, so we don't have to pay the maintenance fee for that. If you have uh, an Amazon uh, account or something like that, it's, you know that it's not a good thing to keep. Amazon computer running, they, 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 they cost. Um, so as you can see, we, 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 uh, it's turned down this computer and this computer, so we don't have to pay the maintenance fee. And it's still optimizing and, and trying to figure out. The nice thing is we can actually kill computers. So let's kill one of these computers. Let's kill this one. So what happened is uh, the computer killed, what was killed, all the processes got unassigned, and immediately they got assigned again. Right? So let's kill a bunch of computers. No problem. Um, oh, actually, now it's apparently I've maybe killed a little bit too many. It's really hard to get uh, to get to feasible solution. Maybe it's impossible. Maybe it's not. It's it's uh, without actually uh, trying every com uh, combination. It's impossible to tell. But uh, okay, it's doing its best, and, uh, and hopefully it gets uh, it gets feasible. Okay, I'll try this. So. Right, this is a Java project, right? OptaPlanner is a Java project. So let's suppose you want to use this yourself, um, and uh, you're probably wondering how the, the, does this integrate with my current uh, Java stuff. Yeah? Uh, so let's take a look at the domain model of this cloud balancing problem. I'll actually focus on this cloud balancing problem, so where we are assigning processes to computers. Uh, this is the computer. It's a plain old Java project, you know? It has a CPU, it has those, the CPU power, memory, band, memory and network bandwidth, so how much memory it has, and it has a certain cost. If you look at this in Java, this will look very familiar. It's playing out for you. It says there's nothing special about this. Right? No, it's, that's it. And some getters. Yeah, I need getters. So um, you probably, if you are using something like Hibernate, you probably have this already. You, you can throw Hibernate annotations on there. That's fine. That's great. You can get it from the database. If you use Xtreme or JuxB, you can get it from the XML file. Doesn't, I don't, OptoPlanner doesn't care. Then you have this uh, process, which is, uh, has a required CPU power and so forth. And, and then a process has one computer, right? So we need to, what, what does, what does OptaPlanner need to do? It needs to fill in the computer for every process. It needs to decide which process get, goes to which computer. So um, 
or help the planner to be able to understand your domain model. You need to tell them, okay, this process is what I call a planning entity. It's, this is something you, of the planner, can play with. And um, the, the getter of a computer is a planning variable because that's where, he, where the planner can play with. So how does it look in, in the code? So we have uh, our planning entity. We have our uh, properties which we'll use for the constraints, but which uh, our planner, planner won't play with. And then we have our uh, get computer. So what do we have here? So we have our app planning variable, so he knows that uh, this computer is uh, a planning variable, so pla the planner can play with it. And it's also, you also need to define uh, what computers can I put in there, where do I get my computers. And in this case we basically said, um, there's a, on, on the solution object, so I'll get back to that in a second, we have a list of all the computers, uh, you know, just a Java util list. That, those are all the possible computers you can put in there, so choose one of those. Um, so. There's a solution object too, which is basically your data set. This represents your single data set. So it has a list of all of your processes and a list of all of your computers. And um, it also has a score. Why is that? That's well because um, if you have a list of all your computers and a list of all of your processes, those processes uh, are assigned to those computers. So that represents a certain score. The score is, for example, minus one hard constraint, minus 55 soft constraints or something like that, right? So um, and if it changes, then the score needs to change to it. Okay, so um, this gets um, an annotation planning solution, and the process list gets a little, because of course, planner needs to figure out, okay, where are your, all your entities? So the, the process list gets an annotation too. Let's take a look at the code behind, co code behind this. This is a little bit, I'm still looking at maybe simplifying this a little bit, but um, it works well. So we have a list, um, we have a cloud balance, which is a solution. And it also has um, a score type. In this case, it's a hard and soft score type. The reason for this is that you can choose your own score types. Um, but more, like 90% of the users, like, or even 95% of the users, use a hard and soft score. You have hard constraints that need to be fulfilled to have a feasible solution, you have soft constraints, uh, which you want to optimize as much as possible. Um, and then, of course, you have your list of in this case, uh, and you have and you have a list of all your processes. So we need an annotation on the list of processes, as I've mentioned before, so planner can figure out, okay, here are all my planning entities which I can play with. Right? Again, this is a uh, uh, POJO, it's except for the fact that it has a solution implementation of the cloud. So the, the data set is a little bit more special. Um, it also needs, if you use rules, it also needs, uh, if you use rules score calculation, I'll get back to that in a second, about what, what different types of score calculations uh, are available. But then you also need this, so you can uh, give it a list of all the computers and everything else it might need to calculate its constraints, basically. And last but not least, it has its score, right? So this is what you care about. If the score, uh, if the hard and soft score has, is feasible, uh, it doesn't matter if it's feasible, then uh, it's a good solution, uh, if not, uh, it's, it's a solution which you cannot use. Um, okay, let's take a look at the score constraints. Let's start with a question. Given two solutions, which one is better? So let's suppose um, I decide to let's put process A on computer X and let's put, put process B on computer Y and we have another solution which does the other way around. Which of these two solutions is better? How can we do this objectively? So um, over here we have two computers, A and B, both need three CPU, and we have uh, two uh, uh, sorry two processes, and we have two computers, one with four CPU and one with six CPU. You can also see they have a certain maintenance cost, right? Five hundred and thousand dollars for years, whatever. So one way we could do this is we could say we put both of the processes on computer X. You can see that's a bad idea, right? Because uh, we'll take way too much CPU. So we get, uh, we have two CPU to little, uh, but we only have to pay $500. So we get the score of being minus two, minus 500, right? Do you think this is a good solution? Probably not, right? Because uh, your, user, your users will start complaining and saying, okay, uh, I'm trying to access my mail and it's going, it's slowing or it's slower or if, it, if, if this would be not CPU but RAM, then I get an out of memory error and it basically won't work at all. So that's not good. Another way you could do it is to say, okay, I'll put both of them 
on the, the different computer, right? Uh, okay, in that case, zero hard constraints broken, great, but we do have to pay $1,500 uh, now. So it, the, the, the bill has gone up. Given these two solutions, which one would you choose? Second. The second, yes, of course. Because this one will, your users will start calling you and saying, okay, uh, my, my applications don't work. This one will just cost you more. So that's why we always check the hard constraints first. So we basically, we take a look at this difference, and we always check the hard constraints, and basically we ignore the soft constraints. Unless, of course, the hard constraints are the same. So let's take a look at this solution, where um, both of the computers are, uh, both of the processors are on the second computer. We will get, of course, this score: zero hard minus thousand soft. In this case, given these three solutions, which one would you choose? So. Third one, yes. Uh, because um, this one is the cheapest, right? Uh, you don't break any hard constraints, and you only have to pay for one computer, and it's only a thousand dollars. But that's the one you want. So the, 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 the thing is, first look at the hard constraints, if they are the same, and look at the soft constraints, and try to optimize the soft constraints. And that's an objective way to, 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 to find a solution. Okay, so uh, score calculation. OptoPlanner has three uh, ways of doing this, and you can choose. You can use simple Java, which is very easy. You just get uh, your cloud balance and you return back what the score is. Um, you have also incremental Java. That's uh, also, again, it's written as you write your score calculation in Java. The, po the point is, of course, you define your constraints. Maybe you want, uh, so uh, if you have cloud balance, the cloud balancing problem, you want to uh, minimize the maintenance cost, but maybe you want to maximize it, right? Or maybe you want, other, you want to ma uh, maximize other things. For example, in the nurse rostering problem, um, I want the, the, or the late shift and then an the early shift wasn't the problem, but in other hospitals it might. So it, it's domain specific which, what you want to do. So you need to write this yourself, of course, right? So uh, again, you can write in simple Java or incremental Java or with rules. And rules are really nice because uh, in incremental Java, it's much faster than simple Java. And in rules, it's incremental, but you don't have to uh, write that much code. So let's take a look at simple Java. Um, so you basically have a calculate score method. It's a single, in, so you implement this interface simple score calculator. And you get your cloud balance, and you basically, okay, you take a look at all your processes. You say, okay, if a, if a computer has more processes than it can uh, provide for, then we're going to uh, lower the soft hard constraints. And then we're going to take a look at all the computers which have a soft constraint. And it's, it's that simple. Um, it's interesting that you can bridge to an existing system with this and so forth, but it's slow. It's really, really slow. Um, it's it, depending, uh, because you are constantly going through a loop. It's much, much more interesting if you can do incremental score calculation where you say, I've now moved one process to another computer, let's just change, recalculate the score for that delta. That's not re if you have 100 processes, uh, 100, pro yeah, 100 computers, and we just change one process to another computer, and we don't care about those 98 other computers. They, their score won't change. So uh, incremental score calculation is, they only recalculate the score delta. And uh, that's much, much faster. It scales, especially if you scale up, right? If you go uh, above 100, above, above, above 100, above 1,000, especially anything higher, then uh, you in, in number of entities, you definitely want to increment the score calculation. It's very hard to implement. It's much of boilerplate code. You need maps and, and so forth. So if you really love this kind of stuff, you can do this. Uh, and then the problem is, uh, score calculation is an iterative process. You go, you write something, you say, your, your user tells you, I don't want this to happen. You want, so I want to minimize the fuel. You do that, you give them that solution, Oh, but uh, yeah, but unless of course this happens, then I do want to. Uh, then of course you can take more fuel. For example, the vehicle routing problem. Um, you say you implement it like I've just shown you. You take this to the user, then the user says, yeah, but there are things like uh, explosive materials, and uh, they should not be uh, put together in the same truck. So we want to split that up, right? So that's a new constraint, and they constantly add new constraints, especially the figure out. It's pretty easy for you to add them. They'll, they'll, they'll come, come back to you a lot of times. 
and adding more and more constraints. If you have to do this in incremental Java with this maps, it's just way really too much work. So there's, then there's rule score calculation, uh, which is also incremental, uh, but it's declarative. Um, so you use the rules rule engine. Um, and I'll show you an example for that. And there's an integration opportunities. Um, if anybody, who here is familiar with rules? Okay, not too many people. Uh, rules is a rule engine, right? So um, it's basically a very smart way of doing if known, if else known, that that's, that's a bad explanation. Uh, a couple of my colleagues will probably hunt me down for that uh, way. Um, it's just, I'll, I'll show the code and uh, let's get back to that. Nice thing is there's a web interface for writing rules and there's decision tables where you can actually write your rules in Excel and so forth. So there's quite a, a few integration opportunities there. But let's take a look at, at a, a, a rule with rules constraint. So here we're saying uh, there's a rule, computer cost, and when there is a computer, so any computer, right, and there exists a process which is assigned to that computer, then we have to pay for that uh, computer, right? It's that simple. So if there is a computer and there is, exists a process which is assigned to that computer, then you have to pay for it. And how we're, what we're going to do, this part is Java code, this is really basically rules left hand, uh, the left hand side, what they say, the, the rule part. And uh, if that indeed happens, then we're going to basically uh, reduce the cost from, uh, so we're going to, uh, have the soft constraint will be reduced by minus cost. So uh, let's suppose this computer costs $500, and we get minus 500 here. Um, uh, so, you could actually add extra things on this. For example, you could say the process of the computer is assigned, uh, is a process assigned to that computer, and that process is an important process, then we'll add uh, some extra constraints, right? So you can, you can add extra rules and play extra rules and so forth. So here's one of the hard constraints about the CPU power. It's a little bit more complex because it, it, uh, it's a pretty complex one already because it hasn't accumulated and, and that makes it a little bit harder to read. But anyway, if, if there is a computer, right, which has a certain CPU power, and then we're going to do an accumulate. So from accumulate of all the processes assigned to that computer. So you can see that here, all the processes assigned to that computer. And we're going to sum the required CPU of, of those processes, and then we'll have a certain total. And if that total is more than the CPU that the computer had, then we're going to, uh, then we have a problem. If the first time you're looking at this, this can be very hard to read, right? Especially if you're used to plain old Java code. So you might say, okay, I'll use a simple Java. That's great. But um, there's a lot of power in here. And once you get used to them, uh, it's really nice because the rule is isolated. You know, you add an extra, you add an, add an extra rule for an extra constraint. It's that simple. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. You want to remove one constraint, you remove it out. And the rules, rule engine, the rules rule engine figures out uh, how to opt optimize it and figure out the fastest way of doing it, and brings in incremental score calculation. So um, we've had uh, we have our domain objects in Java. Uh, we have our score constraints in Java or in rules. And now we need to solve our problem, right? Find a good solution. So um, there are a couple of ways you can do it. Uh, configure a planner. Um, one way is by XML, it's the recommended way. Uh, but you can also do it by, JV, by Java API, if you want to do runtime decisions and so forth. Um, now what, we, what happens here is quite simple. We're saying, okay, um, here's our solution class, our planning empty class. Might actually change that in the, in the future to actually Detect these automatically, but for now we actually have to um, specify them so that I can find them. And the second thing we do is, like you can see here, we are using a hard and soft score type, right? So um, Planner comes in with a bunch of score definitions, and the most common one is hard and soft score. And we say we have yeah, hard and soft constraints, right? And then we give it, if you're using rules, we just tell them, okay, here's our score rule. So that's the file where we have those um, uh, rules rules. And uh, at the bottom, we can say which optimization algorithms will be used. So, once we have this XML file, uh, we have a we put that in a factory, uh, an XML server factory. And we, um, uh, what does a factory do? Well, it builds a, what does a solver factory do? Well, it builds a solver. Not much special in there. Uh, so we give it our data set. So this is the one we create. So we get that one from Hibernate or from JPA or from. 
uh, some some other decks, cream or transmit or whatever. Um, you can create uh, whatever you want. You ask the solver to solve it, and you get back your optimal solution or your best solution at least uh, in the given time, in the time given. So um, you probably wonder how long does it solve? Uh, well, you can specify it in many different ways. You can say um, give it five minutes. You can say uh, do it until until it stops improving, or you can just do it asynchronously from another thread. So you can say start solving, and I'll actually and when I actually need a solution, uh, then I'll, I'll ask it. So um, for big problems, you can say I'll start it and, and let it run during the night. For um, other big problems where you actually want real time planning, uh, what they actually do is they they start it and uh, they continuously stop it. Uh, you know, continuously terminate it, not really terminate, but they, they say, okay, um, give me the best solution right now. So tell my vehicle, you now need to go to that address and lock that, so make that immovable. So basically tell planner, um, uh, so ask planner, give me the, the shortest route, right? And it gives you the shortest route. And once, it, once the vehicle starts driving, then you basically tell planner, okay, give me where the vehicle needs to go now and, and tell me what the rest will be and lock down this first segment so it don't, won't ever change it anymore. So it's the same thing as with the inertial string, but they actually do, you can actually do this in real time. Um, that's the nice thing if you, with the asynchronous termination and so forth. Um, so a little overview of this, so we have our domain objects, Java, uh, our computer of course is our domain, our cables. But this is a very simple domain hierarchy, right? If you have anything serious, then you have your, your computer might be in a certain building, and your process might be of a certain type, uh, might be belong to a certain service. So, for example, uh, you have different processes of the same mail servers, right? And then you might have a constraint that says that server, all the mail processes should be in a different building because if a building blows up or burns down or, or something happens, then uh, our mail system should not be down. So we want to spread that out over the globe. Uh, so you can have a very rich domain uh, hierarchy, and you might actually have very constraints which you should go over, uh, go over those. Um, then you have your uh, constraints, of course, written in Java and DRL, which uh, is con this XML configuration or Java configuration gives you a solver factory. So you give it your data set. You can see that the processes are unassigned. Doesn't know yet. They're still null solver uh, computer. And then you solve it, and then you actually have uh, a data set there. Then you have a filled in data set. So you know in the process C needs to go to computer X uh, because that's the best we need. Uh, so optimization algorithms. What can we throw on this? So one of the su suggestions we gave us, or maybe not so suggestions, is brute force. So brute force tries every combination. So we basically put um, all four of the processes in the first server. And then we try three of them in the first server, one in the second server, and so forth. Now, to give you a slight indication of how big this could be, this is a binary number because you have two servers, x and y. So x is one and y is zero, and it's and for every uh, process you have a digit. So this is a binary digit, binary number, of four digits. So we have two hundred fifty-six, uh, two hundred fifty-six combinations. Uh, if you scale out to, let's say, a thousand, uh, let's say you have uh, ten servers, right? Then you have a, a decimal number, and you have ten processes, and you have a decimal number of ten digits long. So how many processes do you have? I'll get back to that later. Um, here's how you configure it, very easily. Great brute force in planet. Uh, how does it scale? Uh, here we have six processes, and the number of computers is always the number of processes divided by three in these data sets, so, uh, to keep it simple. So six processes, two computers, 15 milliseconds, and we have looked at every possible uh, way in. And this is with incremental score calculation, by the way. Um, nine processes, 1.5 seconds only. 12 processes is 17 minutes. So 12 processes and uh, four computers is 17 minutes to try every combination. You can see that it actually goes up, or to add three more processes, it goes up by a number of a factor of 608, and got worse. Originally, it was only times 100. Right? So 15 processes, probably a day, something like that, right? 
1200 processes. Any, anyone got an idea how we can solve 1200 processes with brute force? Here's my suggestion. Uh, because it will take, it will take a little bit of time, a couple of billion years. Um, so let's try something better, right? So we have the first fit one. First fit is very similar to the one I showed in the beginning, except for we don't actually order these. So we just uh, we don't order the process in a certain way. We just take the, the first one, put it in there. The second one, put it in where there's room. The third one, put it in where there's room. And the fourth one, wherever there's room. There's no room, right? So it's not optimal. Um, but here's how you configure it in plan. You just say, give me first fit, please. That's a configuration heuristic. Um, so it's pretty easy. You copy paste this in a few lines of code. Uh, in your XML, and here's how it scales out. So, in, we're no lo longer talking about uh, maybe six or maybe nine or twelve processes. We're actually talking about three hundred processes, six hundred processes, twelve hundred processes. And now, for twelve hundred processes, this takes nine seconds. It's a little bit better than a couple billion years, right? And so, we, this is something we can actually put into production. Right? Brute force, pretty brute, brute, brute force, and production is. This. It's pointless, right? Uh, uh, nobody has only 15 process, uh, 12 of process. Okay, so okay, <coughs> this kind of works. And let's take a look at the results. Well, I have four data sets. Um, so the, this, this is the one with 1,200 processes. And the good thing is that all the hard constraints are satisfied in the first fit, at least in these data sets. It depends on the data set, how difficult it is. But in these data sets, they are all uh, satisfied. So Hard constraints are, uh, so CPU is met, RAM is met, and uh, network bandwidth is met. But, uh, of course, how much does it cost us? What is the maintenance fee? Maintenance fee is, in this case, 544,000. Uh, so, um, of course, these are different data sets. This is a small data set, and the data sets get bigger, so it's normal that it's, it's, it's more and more. So let's take a look at if we use some smarter algorithms and then right, this right, we can get better results. Next one is first fit decreasing, which I've shown in the beginning, where we just do the same thing except that we uh, do this in decreasing difficulty. So this one is more difficult to schedule than this one, so uh, let's schedule that one first. So if you're doing nurse rostering, <coughs> you're first going to schedule the shifts which are more difficult to schedule. So the shifts on the Saturday that nobody wants to do, or Sunday, or Christmas Eve, you're going to schedule those first, because um, you have far more playroom with the other shifts. Um, if you have vehicle routing, um, then the more difficult ones are the ones who are further away from this thing. So there's, there's a couple of different ways you can try that. Now the thing is, of course, that um, the, the, what is more difficult is business specific. It kind of depends on your, uh, your domains, right? It, it actually depends a lot on, on your constraints, but it more depends on actually what, um, on a general concept of what is, what is more difficult to schedule. Uh, for example, in employee rostering, the, the employees which have uh, more skills Right, or more rare skills, you know, um, they are uh, far more uh, harder. Uh, they, you, should, you should scale those first, so they don't end up, end up doing uh, other skills. So they end up doing their more more rare skills instead of uh, other tasks. Um, so here's how you configure it. You say first to decreasing piece, and and, and uh, that's the idea. The thing is, it needs to figure out, like I said, domain specific, which one is more. Uh, one is more difficult. So you need to have a comparator, which is just a, a Java comparator, so it's a, a plain old Java comparator in compare methods, where you have to compare two processes and return uh, and tell them which one is more difficult or not. And in this uh, in implementation, I've shown you, I've just basically uh, compare, just multiplied the CPU power times the memory times the network bandwidth. If you're really serious in this, you will might, actually might normalize that maybe a little bit. And there's a couple of ways you can do this. You have a, a more, have a other ways of compare comparator too. But the thing is, you just figure out which is more difficult. One. And uh, on your entity, you just say, okay, this is my difficulty comparator. So uh, here's the one you want to use. And you can actually write it in XML starting from 6.0. Um, so let's take a look at the, the, uh, the scalability of that. So uh, how fast does this run? You can see it's pretty much the same thing. It's a little bit slower apparently, um, but it's pretty much the same thing. 
So it scales out similarly. You can still see that this doesn't really scale out linearly yet, yeah? Right? It does still scale out a little bit like that. This, this might look, uh, but um, it's not like brute force, which just scales out like this, right? Uh, and, and, and not even a little bit like it, but it's just straight up. It's, it's forced. Um, okay. Let's take a look at the results. Uh, here, we've already saved uh, about 14,000, I think. 14,000 uh, dollars by using first with increasing. It's pretty nice, right? So, local search. Local search and is a form of meta heuristics. Um, so, um, what we do is we basically take a solution, uh, which is this one, and we start moving things around. We move this yellow one down, so it gets here. We switch these two, so they are switched. Uh, we move, we switch these two, so they are switched. Oh, look, we found a better solution. That's basically the idea behind local search. It's pretty much how human planners works. Only, only the, instead of doing it, you know, a few times per minute or per second, does it a few times per milliseconds. But that's how local search works. It's basically, a computer uh, with, a, with, an, uh, with a human on speed. So. How does this work? So we, we start off with an empty solution, right? We use a construction heuristics, best uh, usually first to decreasing to get to a good solution, uh, to get to a starting solution, then you use a meta heuristics to actually find a better and better solution, such as W. So there are several forms of uh, uh, local search. One of them is W search, uh, which is a conservative choice. I like it, but it's a conservative choice. It's a conservative so how do we configure that? Well, we basically start with construction heuristics and then we local search for it. One of them, one of the local search algorithms is hill climbing. The thing is quite simple. You basically take the move which improves the solution. Uh, so you take a look at all the... So you can switch these two uh, processes or these two processes. You just take the, 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 the move which has the best uh, move solution. But that really gets stuck in the local optima very fast. And that's why they call it hill climbing, not mountain climbing, because this person is looking this far, right? So it's, it's looking over, it start, he starts here, he looks, okay, this is going up. So he looks over here and says, okay, this is the best move I can do. From here, he looks around and says, this is the best move I can do. From here, he looks around and actually, his moves are big enough to get over here, right? He looks over around here and gets here. But then it's and as soon as he's actually on the top of this hill, what happens is, he takes a move down, and the next move he does is go back up the hill. Because there, he, he won't go down more because there's a, this is good, this is better. So he will never reach the mountain top. He will never reach a good solution. That's why hill climbing is, sucks, it's, bad. it's a bad algorithm. But um, uh, um, now, for a record, this is a 2D uh, 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 visualization of the problem. If you have a, a 300 processes, it should be a 300D visualization, 301 actually, uh, D visualization to show it. So what you see here is, is actually not that relevant. But, uh, again, okay. so um, here's how you configure a hill climbing. Um, you say, okay, uh, just give me a local search that will give you a hill climbing, but you probably want to uh, set an, uh, an accepted count limit, which is the number of moves it will evaluate. Because if you try to evaluate all the moves, um, it's far, 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 far less than the number of solutions, but it's still too much to actually scale out in practice. Um, so uh, this is the untweaked value. This is what most people use. Uh, you, you can start tweaking that. We have a toolkit for that to actually help you tweak that. Um, but uh, it depends on how much time you want to put into actually using this stuff. Double search. Um, double search is basically the fix for hill climbing. Uh, so you can see here there are two paths. This path is going up, this path is going down. I want to reach the highest point in the world. So logically, I would say, let's go up, right? Take the up path. The thing is, uh, this guy has already been to that mountain, let's say, which is one of the biggest mountains in the world. So he's now taking this other path, uh, Mount Everest, and uh, that's, no, that's big, of course. Right? So uh, for a record, this is not a typing error. It's called Tabu with a U and that's, that's how the, the inventor. Uh, what, what you, let me just first explain the algorithm. It's pretty hard to explain, and, and, and I actually have slightly, uh, if you have, still have time, but um, the idea is that annealing, you take steel, 
uh, you heat it up and then you slowly cool it down and uh, when it cools down the, uh, the molecule, molecules they fit together but if you cool it down too fast you get uh, bad steel and you can break the steel if you cool it down slowly the molecules fit together uh, into each other what the algorithm does is it tries to find a better and better solution and, it's slow, and in the beginning it, um, it does this what, what they call a high, high temperature so it tries a lot of different moves and, 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 re and accepts them very fast but as, it's, as it gets near the end it, uh, it's, 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 it's more like hill climbing that probably doesn't explain it well enough but it's just a very hard argument for it there's a, there's a big mathematical equation behind it the thing is you don't care about that, right? You just care about how do I use it and does it give me better results for my use case. So uh, here's how we use it. This is actually a tweaked value. This is done with the toolkit to figure out what the best value is. And um, for this use case, and then you try it out. So you're probably wondering, um, so what is the best one? You just showed me similar idea and toggle search. So let's take a look at this use case. So in this use case, you can see first fit is the red ones. So the same data sets as I've shown before. Uh, and the blue ones are first fit decreasing. And now we have toggle search and similar and needle. And you can see for this use case, toggle search is the best one. Uh, now, how did I figure that out? Is by I implemented toggle search correctly, similar needle correctly, and I run them on these uh, on these data sets. That's the only way you can be sure. To, to, that's the only way you can predict which uh, which algorithm works best. That that's pretty annoying because you have you take a different use case. Uh, like nurse rostering, and in nurse rostering it turns out that similar needling is the best implementation. At least in the nurse rostering with the constraints I've implemented them, if I change my constraints um, heavily enough, strongly enough, uh, then you, you actually might see the toggle search a little bit better. So um, here, that's the catch. You need to, um, to, be, to know which is the best algorithm, you need to implement them all, and you need to implement them correctly. And, um, Similar needling, most of the implementation on the internet are plain wrong. Actually, I, I implemented it uh, twice incorrectly, said it was a bad algorithm, uh, until the third time I actually implemented it correctly. So, um, it, it's a pretty hard thing to do. So, the, the, the advice I want to give you is that um, you can try it right in yourself, but uh, you, you should actually, to find the best algorithm, you actually have to try them all. Now, how much does this win us? Well, in, in this case, the, 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 the return on investment is not that big. Um, for first fit decreasing, we have 4% better, uh, which results in, 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 into about 50,000. For toggle search, we have 14% better, and for similar meaning, we have 11% uh, better. The thing is, this is a toy example with few constraints. Um, it's also not real-world data. Uh, the other examples have real-world data, and so they are far more interesting. So let me show you one of the other ones. So, um, so, what am I showing? I'm showing vehicle routing. Okay. So, uh, Planner comes with a toolkit called the, uh, the Benchmark Toolkit, also open source, also part of Planner, of course, right? And um, you basically feed it a number of data sets. So, I've given it a whole bunch of data sets, as you can see here, about 30. And you give it a bunch of uh, solver configurations. So, let me just show you which ones I've given it. In this case, uh, just first fit decreasing in public search, not much. But anyway. You can see all the data sets here. And um, what it does, it tries all these algorithms on these, all these data sets and tells you which one is the best one. It, says, it tells me, Tabo search, excuse me, Tabo search is the best one. It's actually Tabo search with field, first with decreasing in front of it. Um, it's the best one, that's the one you should use in production. Of course, this is, this is not really competition because there aren't, and aren't any other materialistics. But uh, the nice thing is, it also shows us how much improvement we have. So here's the return on investment. Um, so what happened here is there were four data sets that weren't feasible, so that had broken hard constraints in first set decreasing, and the double search, actually all of them are feasible. You can actually see that um, in the best score. All of them over here in the bottom have zero hard constraints broken. They're all feasible. Okay. So, uh, and now let's take a look at the soft constraints, basically how much fuel did we use, because this is for the vehicle working problem. How much fuel did we save by using a better algorithm, by replacing first fit decreasing with public search? Well, um, you can see it depends on the data set. Sometimes it's 30%, sometimes it's 14%, sometimes it's only 6%. Uh, 
depends on how difficult the data set is. The more difficult the data set is, the more you'll actually save because um, uh, first with decreasing will screw up more. Um, now, so that's nice, right? If a, as a company you can save uh, a nice percentage of fuel per year or per day, um, that's a very nice uh, gain. Now let's take a look at the average. The average here is 21%. Right? So uh, let me show you another data set. And this is the nurse rostering one, the nurse rostering example that was shown in the beginning, you know, with the early shifts and late shifts and so forth. Uh, in, in, and uh, here's some here cases. So let's take a look at the difference. So again, uh, in this case, all the hard constraints were always met by all the algorithms. And I'm comparing, let's, let's take a look, uh, best fit, so uh, which is basically first fit decreasing a variance on that. Uh, so that's basically the, the zero over here, all, all the zeros. With um, double search, another form of double search, and similarly the needling, and in this case signal needling is a big winner. And you can see that over here we have much better percentages, 30%, 70%. So what is this 30%? In this case is how happy are our nurses? How many times would we be able to give them their free off and free day off and so forth? Right? So if it would be hundred, if it would be hundred percent, then we had a soft score of zero. So all the day off requests would have been fulfilled and so forth. Um, now this data set, this 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 benchmark does a whole bunch of more stuff. Like, um, uh, for example, over here you can see how uh, how over time. It evaluate it, uh, the score evolves. So, for example, double search after about 50 seconds it has this score, or on this score depends on, on which algorithm uh, is used, which double search algorithm is used. Um, but um, you can see that similar needling runs up slower. That's because of that temperature thing. But uh, similar needling, uh, that's why it's not a conservative choice. It actually depends on how much time it, 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 it depends on how much time it gets. While double search, you can. Uh, you can actually stop it here and you'll get that solution. If uh, for similar needing, it, 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 it takes into account I get 10 minutes, so I'll slow, warm up slowly. If I get only a minute or only 5 seconds or only 10 milliseconds, I'll go up much, much, much faster. And uh, this has disadvantages and disadvantages, of course. Okay. So, okay. So that was actually the end of the first before the break. Um, so it's uh, so top planner solves planning problems and, and uh, adding constraints is easy and scalable. You just add a rules rule to add a constraint. The incremental score calculation, it's a little bit hard, it's, it's, it's harder, especially if you want to isolate your constraints. So for maintenance, I definitely recommend the rules way. And uh, adding or switching optimization algorithms is easy. You can, you can change that configuration from double search to signal leading and, and back and forth. Uh, pretty easy, it's just a, a few line, changing a few lines of code. Um, and actually, I have a couple of new algorithms in there, like like, like late, late acceptance, which are really nice. They're just the papers are just out. It's just invented, and it's, it's actually slightly better than similar leading and very and very uh, very often. So you can actually switch to that very easily. Okay. By, by the way, if you want to try any of the stuff the stuff out, um, just download the zip. Just go to the optoplanner.org website. There's a big green button to download it. Uh, you download it and you just open the Rundle examples as sh or bat file, and you can try this on your own machine. So if you want to, uh, you want to see any of these examples yourself.